decision. I'm going to take Ronald Reagan out of the equation. I'm going to ask everybody here, who is the political figure, aside from Ronald Reagan, who you most admire? And the second question is the 800-pound gorilla that Republicans want to repeal Obamacare. And it was just in the press last week that the House Republicans uh, know that they, they repeal it. They're going to have to have some type of a substitute because you can no longer be passive or reactive in terms of health care reform. That was the tragedy of the last decade that Republicans made nothing out of health care, and then the Democrats got control of Congress and look what they gave. And so I'm going to ask all of you, number two question, what are your ideas if Obamacare is, first of all, are you going to repeal Obamacare, and if so, what are you going to do about it? Thank you. First of all, I'm going to answer the first question very short, sweet, simple. I don't have a lot of uh, political figures in my life that uh, I think are fantastic uh, people that have influenced me. I like Barry Goldwater. He stuck to his principles. He was a conservative. He was wrongly accused by the liberal media. And in the end, we find out that really his theories uh, were correct. I want to talk about health insurance. I was in the financial world 25 years. I know more about health insurance than anybody in this room and probably 99% of the people in Congress. Health insurance is a problem. I could talk about it for a half hour. I talked about some ladies earlier. Problem you have with health insurance, for 30 years the prices have gone up. If when you first started it, uh, it was 100% covered, then they increased the deductible from 100 to 250, then they said we can't have your family on the plan anymore, we're just gonna cover the employee. Then we said we're going to cover half the employee and a deductible of up to a thousand because the cost goes up every year and it's going up. One of the main reasons is because of tort reform. No one touches it. They've heard me talk about tort reform at every meeting. Doctors pay between 25 and 35 percent of their revenue in malpractice insurance. And when you go see a doctor, they could probably look at you and say, hey, I could run two tests, I could diagnose your problem, but they don't. They run 12 tests, they run the whole battery. They have to run the battery because if they don't run the battery and if they misdiagnose, they get sued. And when it goes to court, the attorney says, why didn't you run that test? We don't need any more attorneys in Washington, D.C. They sue them. And guess what? We all pay that cost of having 12 tests ran. Portability needs to be addressed. It's a simple fix. If you have a pro as long as you buy health insurance when you're young, when you should have bought it from a risk management standpoint, then you should be able to keep it. If you leave a company, you should be able to take it with you. That morbidity cost is built into that product. I've talked with many, many uh, of, of the actuaries, and that's not an interesting conversation, believe me. And I understand how they price this. I, I, this three minutes or whatever I have is not near enough time. So I'm going to leave it go at that. If you'd like to talk afterwards, fine. Go on my website, jeffthompsonforcongress.com. i got a video on it about health care. We have to reform health care. It's broken. But nobody wants to touch tort reform because they're all a bunch of attorneys back there. Thank you. Jeff took my guy. I, I, I have the privilege of serving in the, in the Air Guard where Barry Goldwater started. And so Abraham Lincoln. And uh, Obamacare, or the Affordable Health Care Act, as it should be called. Uh, yes, I would repeal it, because it's not about health care. That law, 2,700 plus pages, was not designed, written, or passed with health care in mind. It was passed with regulation, 16,000 IRS agents, extra taxes on your mortgage, everything except the one thing that matters, which are the citizens of this country, Republican, Democrat, or Independent. And you know, Jeff makes a good point. Why are we rewarding our companies for being the market drivers of our insurance? The individual should be the market driver for insurance. Look at the auto insurance industry in this country. We have Geico commercials where you can get insurance for $39 a month because those companies are allowed to compete from border to border in this country. You're allowed to carry your auto insurance with you anywhere you go. You're allowed to take it with you regardless of, of where you live. And if you take the health insurance choice out of the hands of government, and quite honestly, out of the hands of the employer, and I'm one of the employers who provides it to, to the employee, but you incentivize it the same way I get 
incentivized, which is a tax write-off. I get to write off the healthcare costs of the employees at our company 100% as an expense. How about you and your premiums and getting that same treatment? How about allowing you at the end of the year to look at your tax statement and say, you know what, I bought my own health care. It was however many hundreds of dollars a month. This is a deductible expense. You know, it's solutions like that that will actually fix the problem in this country. It's not more government, it's less. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, those were two good choices, and uh, I will not reckon be off the table. John Kyle, I'm a big fan. I think he's a, he's a solid, uh, on a local level, I really respect what he's done, and um, I would say, under the restrictions, I choose him. And since I can't choose my dad, because he is, he's not a political figure, but he's my hero. Um, as for repealing Obamacare, another example of the federal government trying to take a problem and instead of addressing the problem, we're going to control the entire industry. We're going to just jump right in and, and take care of you know, all, everyone's insurance. It's just, who's going to pay for this? I mean, this is a huge problem. I would absolutely uh, be dedicated to uh, voting to repeal and initiating anything possible to repeal Obamacare. Obviously, I mean, that's a big, big problem moving forward. What would I replace it with? The free market. Exactly what we've got going on right now. Let the free market take care of insurance. And obviously, the people that are uninsured currently, we are, you know, we're in a position of needing to take care of that, the, that problem. But in terms of replacing it on a global level, I absolutely would not. Um, to answer your question about political hero, um, you know, there are a lot of figures in history I can think of, but a, a current figure uh, that comes to mind is, um, is Paul Ryan. And, and the, reason, um, the reason for that is that in, in all this uh, debate, it was Paul Ryan who had the courage to come forward and really talk in a big way about the drivers of our debt and put all of these, uh, these questions on the table. And he, he, he's been attacked uh, quite a bit for it, and yet he's, he's a, a, you know, a student of Jack Kemp. He studied the, the budget inside and out. There's nobody in Washington who understands it better than him, and he's taken that knowledge and actually come forward and, and come up with solutions and has, you know, put himself on the line uh, in, in pursuit of those solutions. So I, I really admire him for that. Um, Obamacare, uh, you know, I, I think that the Supreme Court's going to uh, uh, rule the individual mandate unconstitutional, which is the appropriate thing to do. And even Obama administration people say that without the individual mandate, Obamacare uh, really can't stand. So yes, absolutely repeal it. And, and then I think what would be a very healthy exercise for our country once it's repealed is to actually attempt uh, market disciplines in the, in the health industry. It hasn't been done. We haven't tried it. And I think that if we, uh, if we uh, put a lot more uh, faith in the market and allow people the freedom to, to choose the type of coverage they would like and, uh, and where they're going to purchase it from. I, I think that will help with, with government not, not injected into the process. That alone will help reduce uh, costs and, uh, and I think that those sort of market disciplines are what this country is really looking for in the system. Thank you. So I'm going to be a little more set up here. I would say John Rhodes, sort of one of the unsung heroes. And Leah, I thought she was going to steal that from me because she went to John Rhodes Junior High. And so I, I really uh, feel fortunate that I was able to meet uh, Senator Goldwater when I was in college and Cassie Roper, uh, Congressman uh, Rhodes, after he retired. It was really a pleasure to get to know him better. We all remember when he ran for governor for about a month. That was, that was a really uh, neat time, I think. Um, and so, Obamacare, my fear is this. I'm not a Supreme Court justice. If they say it's not unconstitutional, one thing doesn't change. We still can't afford it. So it's going to be incumbent on those that are in elective office right now, as well as the people who voted them in, to really drill down for their elected officials and say, we can't afford this. Supreme Court will find that's terrific. We still can't afford it. That doesn't change. Uh, quite frankly, I was happy to see that uh, quite a few congressmen I'm not sure any senator, the track congressman that uh, voted for Obamacare, they got 
fire. Terry Mitchell was one of those guys. They should have. This trap says it's, it's a very, very big bill. Most of them didn't read it, but they passed it. The first iteration of Obamacare didn't apply to them. The second iteration it applied to the younger members of Congress because they went on Social Security or any benefits yet. So we, we can't have laws that are passed that don't apply to those pass the laws. Okay. But to replace it, yeah, simply said the free market. We talked about court reform, it's gotta happen. We talked about portability, that's gotta happen. We've got to start rewarding good behavior, you know, and not wait until someone needs a big insurance policy to develop this bad. But again, in, in a nutshell, to replace it with the free market and responsible uh, elected officials. Thanks. Regarding the right budget, the Republicans, uh, one of the first things you have to deal with uh, in January uh, is the budget. And, and of course, as Republicans, the right budget is going to be front center to you. Um, could you give me your opinions on how you feel about the Ryan budget, and specifically as we've been talking about entitlements, uh, and, and how you feel, uh, because the, the Ryan budget addresses uh, you know, deep cuts in entitlement programs. So um, I, I'd like to get your opinions on that. Okay, sorry. Uh, Ryan budget, it's a good start. Some people so to say then go farm. The one thing that I don't see in the Ryan budget, or a lot of other budgets, is grow the economy. We have to address the entitlements. Okay? We've got to make sure though, again, going back to those student benefits, those are touched. We've got to have an honest conversation with what that age is when people start receiving those benefits, exactly what those benefits are. And it does talk about that. But you know, my view of the world is this. Uh, we have to earn what we take. And again, going back to the very formula in which we have these entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, there's more people that were, that were producing than were, that were taking. Four to one, now it's three to one. Within 20, 25 years, it's going to be two to one, unless we grow the base, grow the economy. So, you know, Paul Ryan's a pretty smart guy, I don't second guess him, but I don't see whether it's his budget or other budgets, I don't see a lot of talk about growing the economy. And I think that's going to be ultimately the key to any benefits in the future. Um, as evidenced by my previous response, I'm, I'm a fan of Paul Ryan's, but I have to say that, and I, and I read his budget, I was actually in Washington when he when he dropped his budget, and, and I was sitting in, in uh, the office of a, of a congressman from Wisconsin, and, and I read it cover to cover, and, and I liked what I read, except there was a glaring, uh, there was something glaring that was missing in my view, and that was he didn't talk at all about defense spending. And I think that you can't credibly talk about reducing spending unless you include defense spending. And uh, you know, I'm someone who comes from a military family. I'm, I'm a former intelligence officer. Uh, I CIA's budget is, is wrapped up there in, the, in defense budget. So you know, I feel very strongly about national security and the need to to you know be the best and have the, be the best uh, uh, R and D budgets, etc. But. I know that there's room in the defense budget and, and every agency in this government can stand for a cut. So that's where I stand on that. In terms of the entitlement programs, you know, his budget states very clearly that those entitlement programs are the drivers of our debt and, and you know, every, everybody pretty much agrees with that. Um, I, I think that what, what he's done in that budget it, in terms of the uh, Medicaid programs, uh, excuse me, uh, um, the uh, uh, means tested programs, 187 of them, that he said he wants, he wants to block grant them and send them back uh, to, to the state level and have the state administer them. I think that's genius. I think that that's exactly what has to be done to control costs because the problem with our current entitlement programs is they're, the, the way that, they're, uh, that the, the system was designed, they aren't budgeted on a yearly basis. They have their, the, the growth of them is, is without constraint. And this is a way to, to control the cost and, and bring, them, uh, bring it back to the states where they can be administered, I think, in a much more efficient and, and uh, I think, human level without a bureaucracy dictating you know, who, who's going to get uh, what entitlements and for what in terms of the people who uh, are, are part of our social uh, safety net that, that deserve to be helped and need to be helped at some level. Thank you. Paul Ryan, I'm a big fan. Uh, I think that he's come out in front and he's done a lot of the heavy lifting. I think it takes a lot of collaboration to get as far as he's 
he's gone with the, with the, with the budget, proposed budget that appeals to many people. Uh, at this point, I am a fan of that, and I, I, I support it. What you know, until something better comes along. I think my biggest <coughs> complaint would be that um, you know it takes too long to rein in, in the spending. But that's um, you know we have to be patient. It's been it's been many years coming that we found ourselves in this position. There is no magic pill that's not going to happen overnight. A lot of people are, you know, going to feel the pain as we go through reining in spending, so that we can get a hold of our of our national budget. So I am a fan. I'm a fan of his. You know, I think that as a relative, um, you know, newcomer, if you will, in the scope of, of the, the old versus the new guard, I think that he's really come out in front, and uh, and for that I completely respect him. And the second question was there a second question? Oh, entitlements. I think I spoke about that earlier. Um, I do think long term we need to reform. Uh, entitlement spending is affecting our future, and uh, for that, I think that we all need to be focused on looking at, on how do we become sustainable, and uh, that's not the case currently. But I, as I expressed earlier, I would not meddle with um, with those that are in or around uh, in the system already. And on that note, I want to thank you all because I uh, I explained. Um, earlier that that I would have to leave at 8 on the dot and it's 10 after 8 and I, my apologies. My parents have been married 48 years and they're having their anniversary tonight. So thank you for having me. I'm going to have to cut out and, and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. to do quick enough? Absolutely not. You know, if you get into that budget and you look at what's projected out years ahead, it takes 25 years to balance our federal budget. That is unacceptable. I signed on early in my candidacy to something called the Cut, Cap, and Balance Pledge. We are at a point in this country where we're not going to be able to service the interest on our debt. And I don't know about you folks, but my interest rate on my home is pretty darn low and it can't go much lower. You raise points in this country, 2%. It's gonna be absolutely impossible to achieve any type of payment system that will actually pay that national debt down. So we don't have time. I, what I do like about the budget is that it got brought to the forefront. Not many people are courageous enough to say, hey, here's an idea, why don't we try this? And, and, I, and I think that's very commendable. In regards to the entitlements, which are a huge problem, and most of you in here are probably represented by David Schweiker, is that correct? Yes? And, and a lot of you, I'm assuming, have been to his presentations and seen where our spending is headed in this country. Not a partisan view, I mean, it's a very realistic snapshot. You have entitlement spending that goes off the charts and you cannot keep up. That's just the reality of the situation. So, you know, we're going to have to talk about things that a lot of people don't like, and, and it's not going to be necessarily an idea for a Republican or a Democrat. We're going to have to talk about private sector options. Give people the option not to not invest into Social Security. Give people the option to actually go outside of the federal government and do what they choose with their money. I think we're going to have to look at the retirement age of this country. It's been brought up a couple times now. You know, those are real solutions that will actually start bringing those dollars back, bringing them in, because it is unsustainable. And you know, the other, the other side of this, we can always go to about an 80% tax rate in this country. Then we won't have an economy. So the reality of the situation is we have to. We have to address the most uncomfortable subject that none of us up here want to talk about, and it's, it's those reforms. And it's going to take real ideas, and it's going to take, it's going to take participation on the part of everyone. And not everybody's going to like the solution, but it's something that's coming whether we like it or not. Ah, the world politics. Paul Ryan's a bright young man. Paul Ryan has his master's degree in economics. 
problem we have with the political system is any time, if you notice, in the last three years, anyone comes up and says, we need to cut anything in specific, the other side of the aisle jumps up and goes, they're going to take this from you. You're going to lose this. If you listen to that, we're going to push little old ladies over the cliff. Paul Ryan's uh, bill doesn't go far enough. And Travis, I believe it's 30 years before it balances the budget. I'll be dead. Okay? Now, Rand Paul, Rand Paul, it's, it's, it's irrelevant, five years. Rand Paul came up with another plan, and it balances the budget. Anybody know how many years? Five years. You know, I can start feeling a little bit more comfortable with that. We're going to have to make cuts. You've heard me talk about it three times now tonight. We have to make cuts. They're going to be painful. We have to be careful where we make them. We're not going to make them by anything to do with it with people above age 50 because you don't have enough time to adjust. I know financial planning. I was in that business 25 years. You don't have the time. Time becomes your enemy as you get older. You have to take advantage of it when you're younger. And the younger people are going to have to take advantage of it. And instead of putting the risk in the government, boring all the money out of the plan, they need to probably put the risk in the market. And those plans can work. And they'll be certainly more effective. But when this country was founded, it wasn't founded with the entitlement of Social Security to say, don't worry, when you get to a certain age, we're going to pay you money. I put in the maximum you could possibly put in every year during my career. That's one of the nice things, I guess, a problem of success. I'll never get it all back out. That's okay. But the bottom line is, the system is not going to work. It's like pushing an elephant through the keyhole. And someone mentioned earlier what the problems were. They missed the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the baby boomers. That's a huge number. We're going to try to pay for the baby boomers' benefits with a third of as many people. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work financially. Paul Ryan's a very bright guy. I give him credit because he stood up and he took the bullet. He stood up and said, okay, here's the plan. But remember, when you go back there, you have to have the ability to sit in a boardroom and get things done. Paul Ryan's plan or Rand Paul's plan is nothing more than a starting point. There has to be negotiation. You need strong people like me that know how to negotiate. I know how to give the other side victories and make them feel good. And I know what victories to give them, what victories to keep. That's not my fault. <laughs> well, to say the boomers now, you're talking about people that are in there uh, probably from about age 52 on? Absolutely not. I've said before, I don't think it's fair to take people above age 50 that don't have the time to redo it and take it away from them. They don't have the time left. They put their money in. What will help, trust me, it makes a huge difference when you make younger people retire a few years later. Two to five years makes a huge difference. The mortality tables have changed. The mortality tables, people are going to live a lot longer. Even though a lot of people say we're not a healthy society, we live longer than any of our past generations. People are going to live longer, therefore they're going to be retired longer. When my parents retired 65, most people thought you were only going to live to 72. That was mortality. So you retired and lived seven years. Guess what? You retired at age 65, you're going to live probably 25 years. And for my kids, and my kids are young adults, I've uh, been married 36 years and raised three adult kids. They're in their late 20s, early 30s. They may live into their mid-90s, maybe even 100. If you can't keep the system the same way, times change. Who would like to ask another question? <laughs>